Hi, I'm Paul Sparrow, director of the Franklin D. Roosevelt Presidential Library Museum in Hyde Park, and we're here to talk about the 75th anniversary of the transition from President Roosevelt to President Truman. Hi, I'm Kurt Graham, the director of the Harry Truman Presidential Library and Museum in Independence, Missouri. Great pleasure to join my friend and colleague, Paul, in this discussion about two very important presidents. So it was April 12th, uh, FDR was sitting at the little White House in Warm Springs, Georgia, at a makeshift desk. Uh, he had been working on some of his papers and letters, and he uh, reached back on the back of his head and he said, uh, I have a terrible pain. And some of the people with him came over to his desk to see how he was doing, and he, he slumped down. Uh, they immediately called the doctors and they laid him down on the bed. And about two and a half hours later, at 3.30 on the afternoon of April 12th, FDR died. Uh, and the world was shocked. Uh, the gra last great hope of peace for the world seemed to disappear. A president that many people had only known as their president for the 12 years he had served. Uh, back in Washington, D.C., uh, Harry Truman is summoned to the White House. And uh, First Lady Eleanor Roosevelt uh, gives him the bad news. Kurt, what was that like for Truman? It was, it was as shocking for him as you describe it was for the world. Um, he had been gaveling the Senate that day. As you know, he came kicking and screaming to the vice presidency. It was not a role he particularly wanted. He felt that uh, people who came into the presidency, as he called it, through the back door, had not been treated very kindly by history. So here he is, only 82 days into this vice presidency. He's over at Sam Rayburn's office. Sam's the Speaker of the House, good friend of his from Texas. They're having some bourbon and branch water, what they call the Board of Education after work. And he gets this call and is summoned to the White House. And that moment when he, he still doesn't know, they didn't say on the phone what had happened. He thought FDR might've just come back early. He goes to the White House. Mrs. Roosevelt said, Harry, the president is dead. And he said, ma'am, is there anything I can do for you? And she said, the question is, Harry, is there anything we can do for you? For you're the one in trouble now. And Truman knew exactly how much trouble he was in. When you look at the photos of his swearing in, which happened just about two hours after that arrival at the White House, um, Bess, his wife, had, had uh, come over as well, their daughter Margaret. You look at the pictures on their, uh, of, of that event, the looks on their faces. Harry Truman was shell-shocked. It was devastating for him personally. He had a whole bunch of things to have to figure out uh, about the, the world about what to do with Roosevelt's cabinet, what to do with his own folks. It was, it was, an, it was not, there was no time for the transition. He just had to jump in and start working. And FDR had been um, absent uh, from, since the election in November uh, during those five months between the election and his death, uh, mm -hmm. and they only met a few times. Mm -hmm. And in those meetings, nothing particularly substantive was discussed. Uh, it is one of the great uh, blind spots that FDR had at that point in his life. He was quite ill. He knew he was ill, but he believed he had more time than he did. He was very comfortable with Truman uh, because he believed Truman was a team player uh, mm -hmm. and that in the future, as, as Roosevelt looked in the future, he felt that there would be time in the future mm -hmm. to bring Truman up to speed. There'd be time for him to talk to him and have him understand what was going to happen. Roosevelt every account I've read was more or less like, yeah, you know, I don't know this guy Truman, but I think he's fine. You know, he, he seems like you said, a team player. He seems like he would do it for the party. He would do it for the country, but it wasn't a, a warm, like, oh yeah, I love that Truman guy. I mean, he's got everything going for him. I, I really respect him. Uh, FDR was really not that involved in the selection. And of course we, we forget how times have changed that the party leaders, the party faithful, the regulars, as they called them, were the ones who made those decisions. They were only in Washington together. As vice president, Truman only met with Roosevelt twice. And they were, as you suggest, brief meetings, uh, no particular substance, uh, nothing, nothing that would have prepared Truman for the presidency to the point that after he became president, in, in those hours on the 12th and that evening, someone came to Truman and said, sir, we have something we need to talk to you about. It was the Manhattan Project. It's interesting that during the convention that July of 1944, um, Roosevelt and Truman never even came face to face. Uh, mm -hmm. Roosevelt uh, was on a train going across the country uh, and, and they arranged a phone call uh, that Harry Truman was supposed to secretly listen into uh, 
uh, with uh, Roosevelt talking to the Democratic leaders. And Roosevelt basically, because Truman at that point was saying he didn't want the vice presidency, uh, mm -hmm. that he was supporting uh, one of the other uh, candidates for it. And FDR said, knowing that Truman was listening, well, if he wants to destroy the Democratic Party, that's up to him. Yeah. <laughs> um, and, and so Truman agreed essentially to be the vice presidential nominee, even though he really didn't want to. As you, as you narrated that, I was thinking of there's some great footage of Truman at that 44 convention where someone comes over and kind of raises his hand up, holds Truman's hand and holds it up. And, and, and Truman says, oh, this is great. Yeah. And, you know, and it was just, you can just see that he, the last thing in the world, as you know, Truman went to that convec convention fully intending to nominate someone else. And FDR had played the game of telling multiple people that he was supporting them exactly. to be this vice president. His, his current vice president, Henry Wallace, he was saying, no, I, I want you to be my vice president. Joe Burns, he was saying, I, no, I want you to be my vice president. And, you know, sort of playing this political game that he often played. Yeah, one of the, one of the interesting books that's been written recently about, about Truman is called The Accidental President. And it focuses on those first four months, basically April 12th, to the dropping of the bombs and the conclusion of the war. And people know that about Harry Truman. If they know anything about Truman, they know that he dropped the bombs. You know, it's interesting because FDR is famous for his first 100 days as he takes office in this terrible economic crisis and essentially completely restructures the American government, you know, fundamentally shifting what American democracy meant in terms of the way the federal government served its people. Right. Uh, but Harry Truman doesn't get enough credit for his first 100 days or 300 days because when he stepped into the Oval Office, the world was on fire. And, oh. and Truman did an incredible job. Those first three or four months when he's got the surrender of Germany, the Potsdam Conference, uh, you know, learning about the tests in New Mexico and, you know, finding out that the bomb is a go. Uh, this, this book that was recently written is called The Accidental President says, never has so much history been shoehorned into so little time. You know, when you think about what happened, you know, we often talk to people about on-the-job training. You know, we've all, uh, you and I, Paul, started our jobs on the same day uh, at these two libraries. And you think about the first hundred days and all you're kind of coming up to speed and you want to do a good job. You want to be a good spokesman. You want to learn the story. I mean, can you imagine what Truman was facing, not just the situation the world was in, but on the heels of a leader like Franklin Roosevelt, who was just universally adored and respected for all that he had done, not just with the war effort, but with the economy and everything else. It was a very, very intimidating moment. It's interesting, you know, the correspondence between Eleanor Roosevelt and Harry Truman uh, that we have in our library collections mm -hmm. are very interesting. I mean, I think Eleanor had a real affection for Harry mm -hmm. um, and that she wanted to try to help him as best she could, mm -hmm. but she didn't want to overshadow him. We have some correspondence as well, and I've read some letters uh, that Truman wrote to Mrs. Roosevelt. And I think it was a, a very genuine respect. I mean, I think he just saw her as a certain kind of person at a certain kind of level. And certainly Bess Truman was, you know, she was scared to death of the role of first lady just because, you know, I mean, Eleanor Roosevelt wrote a daily column in the newspapers. I mean, she, she spoke publicly all the time. She traveled widely. That role, I mean, Bess really wanted to retreat into a very traditional role uh, just do her best and stay out of sight, stay out of mind. I, I, I think she felt that's what her role was. And she spent a great deal of her time as First Lady uh, back here in Independence. You know, one of the uh, generous uh, acts that Truman did in the transition uh, was that he told Eleanor Roosevelt that he couldn't, he didn't feel worthy to work at the same desk that Franklin Roosevelt had used in his 12 years uh, in the White House. And so he gave the desk, uh, which was in the Oval Office, to, uh, to Eleanor. Um, hmm. And she gave the desk to the library. Uh, and once the library got the desk, it's been on display ever since. And mm -hmm. there really is a statement of, of Truman's generosity and his own humbleness to realize that uh, this desk belonged at the FDR library. Right. Well, as we wrap this up, um, looking back on the 75th anniversary of FDR's death and the transition to Harry Truman as president, um, I think about what FDR said, this generation has a rendezvous with destiny. Mm -hmm. uh, and it really spoke to the moment in history uh, that America was facing. And, and whether would democracy survive? Would uh, freedom and capitalism survive in an era where you saw a rise in totalitarianism and fascism and the American democracy was on its knees? But he had such a belief 
in the American system. He believed that no matter what the challenges were, that the American people would rise to that challenge and succeed. And I really think that was one of the things that they shared, um, that Truman and Roosevelt both believed in the value of American democracy. Yeah, no, I think they absolutely did. And I think that they just had a belief in something bigger and grander than themselves. Uh, the reality of what America was, what it could become, and who the American people were. Just that fundamental belief in the goodness of the people. Um, they, they weren't cynical, they weren't jaded. They were realists, they were politicians. They had to make compromises and things along the way, of course. But there was this undergirding belief in something grand and something worthwhile. Well, I want to thank all the people that joined us today. And once we reopen, we hope you'll visit the FDR Library and, of course, the Truman Library right here in Independence, Missouri. Thank you all. Thanks.